Welcome. My name is Darla Hanley. I am the Dean of the Professional Education Division at Berklee College of Music in beautiful Boston, Massachusetts. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second of our panels in this series called Music in the Age of COVID that we're hosting this April. Each panel focuses on a specific part of the world and is designed to bring people together to share experiences and, and engagement that supported and advanced music during the pandemic. Over the past year, I am sure it's safe to say that we have all learned many, many things. We've adapted, we've adjusted, we've created, and along the way, we found new ways to make music, new ways to connect, and new ways to share and monetize our art. Our panels are sponsored by the Berkeley Music Business Management Department, the Professional Music Department, the Office of Global Initiatives, and made possible by a generous donation from the Antonia and Vladimir Kuliev Cultural Heritage Fund. Thanks to all of my Berkeley colleagues on the planning committee, with a special shout out to Professor Ralph Jackadine and to Assistant Chair of Music Business Management, Chris Wares, for taking the lead. Additionally, we offer a special thanks to Barry Lynn from the AVK Fund for supporting our work and helping us engage with the world. I know we are going to all be super inspired by our panelists. Our panel tonight will be moderated by two of our newest committee, uh, excuse me, our newest colleagues at Berkeley, Dr. Heiju Kim, Assistant Chair of Professional Music, and Chris Wares, Assistant Chair of Music Business Management. So I welcome them to the first event that they are co-hosting and moderating together. And to get things started, I turn things over to you, Dr. Heiju Kim. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Heiju Kim and I am the Assistant Chair of Professional Music here at Berkeley. We are so happy that you could join us for today's special panel event. Over the past year, we've attended and observed many panels in the Zoom era. And almost always someone asks the COVID question. How is the topic at hand impacted or changed by COVID? Or how should we adjust in light of how COVID has changed the field? So we've dedicated a whole panel to this very topic as we consider how COVID has changed the overall landscape of music and how we engage with music as artists, performers, and creators, as well as consumers. But while COVID has impacted all of us, it's affected us slightly differently across the wider globe. And so we focus tonight's conversation on the Asia Pacific region. We have an exciting session ahead of us with an incredible group of musicians and artists active in the Asia scene. And now I'd like to hand it over to my co-moderator Chris, Chris Wares and also invite you to drop your hellos in the chat and tell us where you are logging in from. Uh, we, we're so excited to have you and I know we're all spread out all over the globe. So. So go ahead and drop in your hellos in the chat and I'll hand, hand it over to Chris. Thank you, Hey Ju. I am so excited for this panel. Um, anybody who knows me knows how passionate I am about the music business. And you know, the Asian market is just so fascinating, but it can be quite complex. And um, you know, I'm really excited for this opportunity for our students, even myself. You know, hopefully I get to learn something and I'm passionate about learning every day. Um, and I hope maybe, you know, we can maybe demystify you know, the market and, and maybe get some inspiration about what's happening, how people are, are thriving 
during these difficult times. Um, so we can get this party started. Um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Jay Chong. So Jay Chong has been described by NPR as an Asian super producer, member of the seminal Korean group Solid, which was influential in establishing R&B in South Korea. He's a veteran of the Korean music industry with a career that spans markets and cultures. Jay has written and produced for Mando pop superstars Coco Lee and Ame, and has worked with Korean pop legend Kim Gunmo, as well as K-pop acts JYJ and Troublemaker, just to name a few of his credits. Um, he is also the founder and creative mind behind the Asian American hip hop group Asiatics and is in high demand as a music producer with over 70 million records sold, 70 million records sold. Jay's work also includes movie soundtracks, including such films as Forbidden Kingdom, Dear Enemy, and Somewhere Only We Know. As a fixture and integral part of Korean pop music history, Jay was recently featured in the highly anticipated documentary series, K-Pop Evolution, the first episode of which was just released a couple of weeks ago. You can also find him in rich conversation about Korean music, both culture and craft, in a new podcast entitled Talk Back On. Welcome, Jay. Thank you so much for taking part in this panel. Wow, thanks for the invite. Well, I didn't write that intro, by the way. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And next, we want to welcome Taku Hirano. Taku is a first call percussionist with training in Afro-Cuban, Brazilian, West African, Indian, and Japanese styles and instruments. He is a Berkeley alum, go Berkeley, and a professional music major at that, go pro music. So we are especially thrilled to have him back. Taku was a pioneer at Berkeley, being the first graduate, graduating hand percussion major at the college. With experience in a myriad of styles, Taku has collaborated with artists in practically every commercial music genre. He has toured with Fleetwood Mac, Whitney Houston, John Mayer, Bette Midler, Stevie Nicks, Lionel Richie, Isaac Hayes, and Japanese pop icon, Utada Hikaru. Additionally, his credits include Jay-Z, Stevie Nicks, Ziggy Marley, Josh Groban, The Temptations, Nelly Furtado, and Dr. Dre. Taku has taught at the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz and has given master classes at New York University, Carnegie Mellon, Loyola University in New Orleans, and is a frequent visiting artist right here at Berkeley. You may have seen Taku recently in the address given by Recording Academy President Harvey Mason Jr at the Grammy Awards telecast last month where he appeared as an artist performer. Welcome, Taku Hirano. It's great to have you back. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's always great to do this, even in this uh, different age of COVID that we're able to do this. So thank you very much for including me. Next up, Terrence Leong. Terrence is the group CCO of KK Box Group, where he, his work focuses on driving content strategy across business and leads the Ideation Lab, which oversees the incubation of new services, technologies, and applications that have the potential to, re to reshape the industry landscape. He co-founded The Farm, KK Box Group's music venture fund, and is an advisor to record label startup founders and artists seeking unconventional career paths in the digital age. He is also the co-founder of one of the world's first NFT platforms, that is the non-fungible tokens, which we'll get into maybe later, um, Our Song, a place where music creators and fans can create, sell, and trade music content and sentiments as, digital, as a digital asset. Prior to this, Terrence was an award-winning music producer and record executive working for major recording artists, labels, brands, and motion pictures throughout the Asia Pacific region. He's also a songwriter and beat maker. His transnational path has taken him from Singapore to Honolulu to the Bay Area. He's currently based in Taiwan. Terence has a deep interest in education and in advising young artists and entrepreneurs. He's a member of the executive education teaching team at Stanford Graduate Schools of Business's LEAD program. That was a mouthful, but so exciting. Such amazing resumes. I'm so excited for this. Welcome, Terrence. 
Hey, thanks for having me. I'm really excited. And finally, our fourth panelist, Julia Wu. Woo! Julia is an R&B singer songwriter and another Berkeley alum. Seems I have the good fortune of introducing the Berkeley Network today. Widely touted as one of the most exciting voices to have arrived in Mando Pop in recent years, Julia Wu is currently one of the hottest tickets in Asia. Since her debut in 2017, she has released three critically acclaimed albums and has amassed over 100 million views on YouTube and millions more on Spotify. Her signature soulful sound and versatile musicality are redefining the new sound of Mando Pop in the digital age. Julia released her first English album, 5 p.m., last summer. If you enjoyed the song that was playing as you entered the Zoom room earlier, that was Julia Wu's Money Can't Buy You Love from the album 5 a.m., released in 2019. Julia's path traverses Australia, Korea, and Taiwan, so she's yet another transnational diasporic, cross-cultural musical artist. We are so excited to have you back at Berkeley. Welcome, Julia. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here. It's uh, 8 a.m. in a beautiful morning in Taipei. And I'm super happy to be able to give back to the Berkeley community. <laughs> and that was, I did not write that intro. That is like, <laughs> way too nice. <laughs> Oh, it's all true. So uh, we'll just get the ball rolling here. And so today we hope to cover topics such as new sources of income and new ways for artists to collaborate, as well as how to manage your mental and emotional health during these times. So um, let's get started with the very general question first, and we'll open it up to everyone. What has been your experience over the past year? What has been your experience over the past year? And I open that up to anyone who wants to start. We have, we have a shy panel. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Uh, right. Yeah, has it been a year already? Yeah, uh, like seems much longer actually. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think for most music producers, like uh, you know, uh, like myself, uh, we're you know we work in a dungeon anyways. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in terms of everyday life, uh, it's been pretty much the same. Except um, for me, uh, I do a lot of traveling. And uh, I couldn't travel, so uh, that put a damper on a lot of things. Um, so, like, uh, I had to use other means of communication with artists overseas uh, using uh, Zoom. Uh, was Zoom around before the pandemic? I don't remember. But <laughs> I remember, uh, you know, we used to Skype, and that didn't work out too well. And uh, Zoom came in, uh, and they offered, like, the free service and all that. So that it helped with the communication aspect of it. Um, and you know, uh, and we, we just kind of uh, you know uh, we you know we keep on trucking. You know, uh, uh, luckily I kept myself pretty busy in the last year. Uh, I know a lot of uh, musicians. You know, it's a hard time, um, especially for performing artists. But uh, for um, for myself, uh, you know, I got to sort of work on other projects other than uh, the traditional artists. Mm -hmm. um, I took on some projects like like with like video uh, regarding like video games, uh, so I was like uh, so I started making um, like a soundtrack to this video game series called uh, Nightbird Society, um, and it's like a almost like a musical theatrical type of deal, and there's like multiple episodes, and I've just been keeping myself busy with that pretty much the whole pandemic, uh, wow. and and, uh, and you know trying to get songs recorded. Uh, you know, internationally, <laughs> being stuck here in, uh, in California. Yeah. Right, right. And so if there is a silver lining at all, I guess um, what the pandemic sort of forced us to do, all of us in some ways, to, to be more resourceful and to kind of develop our skills in, in maybe other other lanes or um, in other avenues. Um, so definitely. Absolutely, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's, that's really interesting to hear. Anybody else want to chime in on how you're experience has been overall uh, for the past year you know jay when you mentioned it i it it really has been a year like i over now right <laughs> i'm counting for a while <laughs> um I, I i think the last year has been <clears throat> uh 
and you know amid the circumstances uh, i think the last year has actually been extremely eye-opening there have been a lot of opportunities to learn um especially from uh, a technology point of view and then also from having been in the music industry that long like like and and i think musicians are probably more progressive than say executives in the sense where musicians have been learning to work on skype like i've been working with musicians on skype so zoom definitely took that a step up um but um and, and musicians were able to 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 you know to migrate to different platforms very quickly and and then just seeing this amount of creativity not just in content but in in the way people were delivering content so like you know like early in the pandemic like i remember last spring like immediately i i saw a lot of like fundraising music festivals online and that was extremely exciting um and and you know um and, and working with many many independent labels here in taiwan which which disclaimer we're we're actually in a very safe bubble here in taiwan so i i, I think i think that that it's I we're, we're lucky, so I, I might not be able to give the most accurate view of you, but um, during spring last year and like watching <clears throat> watching a lot a lot of different businesses or different entertainment businesses pivot very quickly. What was was one of the most insightful things from last year, and I, I might share more more about that later. I'll mm -hmm. See if anyone. Yeah, but definitely, um, as you said, I mean, you know, every, every sort of region or area kind of reacted to the virus differently. So um, I know that Taiwan is open, right, for concerts. Um, so that, that's sort of an interesting story there. Um, but um, I think Chris might have a question on um, kind of a, a more focused question on this topic of money. <laughs> yeah, maybe I, I, I'd be curious to hear. Um, from everyone actually maybe just qu very quickly from you know taku or, or, or julia like what 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 have, what has been your experience over the last year what are you up to you know what are your projects uh for me uh first of all in over the last year i've actually lived in new york city at the worst of the pandemic and then got up and moved to los angeles right in time for los angeles to flare up so um and in in the midst of everything i did have like being a touring and session musician the touring thing obviously completely dried up. I did have uh, one major tour cancel, a bunch of dates postponed and whatnot. As a session musician, um, a lot of the recording sessions for me had already been migrating towards um, remote. So I was already set up to be recording and I was doing that even pre-pandemic. Um, so it, once I moved out to LA, it was just about getting set up as quickly as possible so that there was no lag in any of the calls or in any of the um, uh, being able to produce, you know, uh, for, for a session work I was getting calls for. So, um, so thankfully, I mean, I was already up and running and, and people know that they were, were already calling me for, for session work wherever I was. So thankfully um, that hasn't taken a hit too badly for me. Julia, let's hear from you. Cool, 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 cool. So last year, um, when the when the pandemic started, I was into almost my third year doing this artist thing in Taiwan. And um, at that point, you know, we had so many great opportunities to perform and everything. We were flying to London for fashion shows, and all of a sudden the pandemic hit and we had to stop everything. And I think at that point, I saw a lot of um, new ways for artists to put out their music and like in the way that they do their music videos and stuff like that. And I feel like a lot of homemade music videos were like a trend in the first week of the pandemic. And I just saw 
all the home blogs and stuff like that on YouTube. And, um, and I was like, okay, everybody's gonna start becoming a YouTuber. All the singers are gonna become YouTubers. And so I was like, it almost felt like what I was doing seven years ago when I was in Berkeley. I was doing YouTube covers and YouTube videos. And it was just very interesting to see that the pandemic took a turn like that. And, um, and for me, I felt like regardless of, um, even though like we couldn't go out to perform for a few months, the I think everybody were very like strict on wearing masks and stuff here. And it was, it was, it's always been like a good habit over in Asia. So I think it got better pretty quickly and it was under control and contained pretty quickly. So we were able to allow, you know, 300 people shows or like 500 people shows, but of course you gotta leave all your, all of your um, information and to put your mask on and they got to like check your temperature everywhere you went so slowly we started going back to live performances and um and I did like a two-day uh show like uh like my own concert it was for like four thousand people and you know to be able to do that at a time like this I, I just feel like we're very blessed so like Terry said I I don't know if I can give the most accurate um, you know, because it's so different in, in everywhere around the world is like in a different, you know, state right now. So, but right now I am working on my next album, preparing music videos. Of, call, of course, we're all like taking precautions and stuff, but things are still going and um, we're still doing music and we're still being able to see people and um and and look at them in the eyes when I'm singing to them I might not be able to see if they're smiling or not but you can kind of feel the eye contact so still it still feels really really nice yeah mm -hmm. and 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 you know I know we're talking about it you know I know that Berkeley is based in North America um but I'm, I'm loving that we're hearing about what's happening in all these different regions of the world and I think that was maybe the essence of having these panels. We, we love hearing about, hey, what's happening over here and, and how does that relate to what's happening in the US? And um, so I think that's great. Um, and I'd like to circle back to that, you know, discussion about you know, the creative process and making music videos at home, but we'll get there maybe a little bit later. Um, I think, you know, what I'd like to talk about now, um, and this is a little bit of a shout out to uh, the chair of the Music Business Management Department, Professor uh, Tanya Butler, who's in attendance. Um, I'm paraphrasing here, but there she goes. <laughs> you know, she, one, of her, one of my favorite quotes is, you know, is, is how, how do you turn your music into groceries? And so let's talk about that. Let, let's talk about, you know, for artists in, in this, you know, new era, in, in the COVID era, in the pandemic, you know, what are the, you know, source, how, like, what are the biggest sources of income? What are some of the new sources of income for artists that have popped up and, 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 and how have you been able to pivot and, and, and thrive in that environment? I'll, maybe, maybe I'll start. Sure. Um, I, I think one of the things I've learned, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can, my cleric, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. It's good. Okay. That notification always scares me. Um, one one of the things that I've 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 come to. So so first of all, like I I, I think like I, I've all I've been a fan <clears throat> of lots of musicians my whole life, but I've I've never been like I've never joined fan clubs or exclusive communities. So <clears throat> I think that's something very new. Like like internet-based paid communities or uh, VIP subscriptions. So like, like Patreon, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, these web tools that are allowing artists to essentially build very, very rich communities with core fans. <clears throat> that's, that's something I, I think that, that, that is gonna be a big trend of the future. 
I think, I think um, <clears throat> Korean groups uh, and, and K-pop artists do that very well. I think BTS is, 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 is an example of that over the last like seven years, they, you know, they have a very, very direct way of engaging with fans. And, 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 you know, like when we, when we started like looking at this space about two years ago, in the beginning, I was just assuming that, that this is just like, you know, an Asian pop thing, like, especially like working in these markets that I work in, like, like fandom is a, a pretty, <laughs> real thing you know and, and it, it can be actually very profitable too um but watching that theory or watching that that practice just just grow internationally and, and and watching like so many um whether they're influencers or musicians um find new ways of whether it's subscription um <clears throat> through say like patreon and 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 funding right essentially like direct funding from fans and um that that has been a very very interesting space and and also gifting um i used to think like gifting like the first time i i, think I, I like gifting comes from my i guess gaming and then and watching that happen in like live streaming spaces and and also like coming to realize like wow okay like like, you know, like uh, people are actually making like a full income just on on doing live streaming and, and, and getting that that revenue from from gifting. I think that's that's also going to to really change. Um, what, what was interesting is I remember I was in I, I was listening to a roast room in Clubhouse on, on Clubhouse in December and and and. It was extremely funny. I, I think it was it was probably right after Christmas and everybody was just up. And and I was on it for like two hours and I and then like five minutes in, I, I noticed the moderator was going, like, put your cash ID in your profiles, or you don't know how much you're worth. And as I listened to it, you know, like people were just roasting each other, telling jokes, and people were just sending money to each other. <laughs> it was like, yo. You, that was a great joke. I just sent you five bucks on cash, and and that that was very interesting too. And and I, and I think that that peer like that peer to peer direct payment is also um, something that that you know we we weren't able to have say like 10, 15 years ago. Mm. So yeah, the possibilities that's... that can come out of that. Mm. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah that... Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No. Uh, that's or that's just a really fascinating development. Um... Yeah, I, I've tried to listen in on some conversations on Clubhouse too. There's a lot of interesting conversations going on in there. But um, I mean, you mentioned K-pop, and I think that um, people are are uh, very kind of curious as to how um, how they did it. You know, because um, I mean, you think about a group like BTS, and and their revenue actually rose uh, uh, by thirty five percent last year. And that you know, I read that in a recent article, um, and that's all despite the you know the fact that the pandemic just you know decimated their tour revenue um and so i wonder i mean i'll ask jay because jay is has a, a foot in, in the k-pop industry as well but um how like can you speak to the vibrancy of k-pop during the lockdown period um and how were they able to see success and even growth during the COVID year yeah um yeah i think uh in 2020 i think bts and blackpink were probably one of the most profitable uh, artists in the world uh, and the reason being was uh, it, it's just uh, they didn't stick to the traditional way of doing live concerts uh, like I, I guess in the western market you know when we think of online concert we're thinking like literal concert like a stage and you know uh, and, and a live performance by the artist and usually I mean that's how it's done here and it didn't get too much traction um, the way it's done in Korea is that it's it's basically like a two-hour music video. Uh, it's like a full-on production. Uh, I mean, it's it's just really well put together. Uh, and they had to bring that extra extra uh, just factor in order to sell that to the masses. Um, so, like you know, you, you're buying, uh, you know, I mean, you're essentially seeing a performance on TV, but you know, it basically takes you into a whole another 
realm, you know, and and that was sort of like a, a, a groundbreaker. And, um, you know, I've been in several clubhouses where a lot of record execs actually were talking about that and how, you know, Korea was so ahead of the curve when it comes to the technology to do that. Like, you know, um, with just the stage, um, techno- you know, technology that goes into the, uh, the actual production. So, you know, even with holograms, yeah. you know, 3D, right. or whatever, you know, exactly. it, all, yeah. You know, VR, everything's been implemented, right. like, you know, and it's, there's, you know, Korea is just very, uh, you know, kind of forward thinking in that sense. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I keep reading about the, the VR, AR. I, I was able to catch uh, a couple of, I guess, two of the concerts, uh, BTS's mm-hmm. concerts. But um, just to drop a figure, uh, I think BTS made something like $20 million in that first concert. Uh, I mean, so, you know, if, you, if you're yeah. doing concerts... <laughs> A uh, pre-pandemic, I mean, you know, say you do it in a football stadium, you know, you got maybe 150,000 people, mm-hmm. you know, uh, you know, at, at, at each show, and you got to pay for the the venue, you got to pay for the stage, line, you know, this this online thing, you know, you could have millions of viewers, like you could, it's like having a million seating venue, like, and you could, you know, so it's it's become actually a, a new thing. Mm. Yeah. Actually, um, so so. That's that works for BTS, yeah. Um, and you know, one of the conversations that I was having with a lot of artists near the beginning of the pandemic was that they were getting frustrated with other artists because what they were doing was they were going and live streaming their show for free or for five <laughs> or ten bucks, and then what it did is that it created sort of you know a consumer perceived value or a low perceived value of, you know, what these concerts are, what these live streams, you know, how much should I be paying for a live stream, right? Um, And so I was wondering, you know, is this really a viable option for, you know, our students in the audience that are like, oh, okay, we're developing artists, we're trying to make it happen. Definitely, yeah, (laughs) definitely not. (laughs) You know, and I think with not just online concerts, but anything like, you know, even Spotify, you know, like, you know, it, it, it benefits the top cream of the crop artists, right? So if you're Taylor Swift, you know, you're, you're making millions off of these streams, mm-hmm. uh, you know, whichever platform, uh, you know, they could start a brand new one today and they'll be number one tomorrow, right? So it's, 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 always, it's always a game of, like, trying to keep up with, uh, like, what you see on TV, which is sort of like the cream of the crop. So, like, you know, if you're judging the entire K-pop industry based on two artists, BTS and Blackpink, you're going to be very far off. <laughs> In terms of like, uh, I guess the the sheer survival rate, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I think you know doing uh, you know like like Terry was saying, uh, having a fan base is everything, you know. Um, and I mean, I guess it goes across the board with any type of business. Even if you're opening up a restaurant or anybody, I mean, if, if nobody lives in your neighborhood, they're not gonna come and eat at your restaurant, right? So you have to have a lot of fan base, and you know how to build that fan base. Uh, there's no uh, rule book on that. It just uh, you know, every situation is different um, for musicians. And, you know, me being, uh, you know, I, I was an artist in the 90s and uh, we, we were at once with major labels. So we got that push. So we had sort of that initial beginning to start kind of other things. Um, and, you know, and that was probably like 28 years ago. And, you know, those fans are still around today. Uh, and, you know, and they, they keep up with everything that we work on, uh, you know, even after that, right? So, like, you know, just having some sort of a, I mean, you know, it, it, to, to some degree, I think everybody has to realize this is show business, right? <laughs> to some degree. It's not like, uh, you know, you go to a, a dentist school and you come out and get an internship and become a dentist. Like, a lot of times it's, it's uh, you know, a lot of, imp- uh, in, you got to improvise, and, you know, and a lot has to do with uh, being at the right place at the right time and uh, meeting the right people um, and networking and all that. So, you know, uh, right now in the, during the pandemic, uh, you know, like the funny thing is uh, I met so many more people during the pandemic than prior because uh, before I had to like schedule a meeting and go somewhere and try to meet these people at a nightclub or do whatever. Like now everybody's on Clubhouse, you know, you're talking to like, I don't know, like you know, CEOs of companies and uh, record execs right at your fingertips. I mean, you can talk to them and DM them and try to connect with them. And I've actually met a lot more people on Clubhouse uh, than than like any any you know years prior. 
Um, th this is an amazing conversation, actually. And just, you know, just to distill what's being said here, um, what I love is that, you know, we're emphasized for developing artists, we're emphasizing, okay, focus on building your fan base and leverage those opportunities. But while you're doing that, if you can establish your niche or your niche, right? And then utilize those direct to fan type of platforms, those subscription or Patreon type of platforms. I think, you know, that's how you can slowly start to build. And that's what I'm hearing. And, you know, using all these new types of technologies, um, networking on new social technologies like Clubhouse, for example. By the way, I'm going to add all of these as the session is done. Sounds really amazing. Uh, sounds like I'm missing out on some amazing conversations. Um, so yeah, so um, I'm really, I'm really like, you know, I, I'm seeing that, okay, yeah, um, build your fan base, <laughs> build your but, fan base. And that comes with, I think, creating as much content as you can. Um, and a lot of artists are too uh, calculating, you know, like, oh man, if I create an album during the pandemic, I can't tour, I can't monetize on this and that, so they just won't. So like, what, from what I, what I have experienced is that like artists, get categorized in two categories during the pandemic like one is like survivors like uh, people who are in charge of their life like you know they hire the producers they hire the musicians they hire the managers they run the show uh, those guys are all like either prepping for a new album prepping for a comeback using this downtime to be creative uh, and then there's the other artists who are kind of like catered by major labels like they don't know anything else on their own and they're just waiting for the major label to give them the green light to work on a project. So they just sit and wait. And uh, a lot of those guys, uh, you know, haven't worked for like 15 months, you know, because uh, 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 the pandemic in Asia actually started before the U.S., you know. And not only that, there was a lot of, uh, you know, unrest in Hong Kong and there was a lot of uh, political things that were happening. So a lot of people weren't working from like maybe like September of 2019, you know, so. You know, a lot of people are just kind of sitting and waiting. And then there's artists who are very proactive in like writing their own songs or trying to work with producers, uh, even uh, remotely online and trying to get content out, right? And, you know, make, like making home videos, just constantly put you, putting yourself out there, right? And, and, and you know, if, if you got fans, that's the way to maintain them. If you don't have fans, you got to get yourself out there with mm -hmm. like as much content as possible. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, for for Julia and Taku, performing artists, um, how have you, you know, what have you done? What have you, um, what sort of channels have you found to be effective in maintaining or fostering your, you know, new fans, maintaining your fan base, um, communicating with them? Um, have you done anything, um, you know, that you've developed over the COVID year? Um, fans or even kind of like, um, collaborating with other musicians, uh, you know, are there some kind of new streams that have opened up in that arena? On my end, um, the, 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 basically like two years prior to the pandemic hitting, in addition to being on tour with Fleetwood Mac on all the breaks, I was forging ahead and I, I uh, started my own band and was booking myself in jazz clubs around New York. Mm -hmm. And what I, did was I got um, I recorded every performance multi-tracked and so I had like a wealth of content just uh, to pour through mm -hmm. and so the pandemic provided me the opportunity to just go through everything and you know find the best of the best and um, distill it down to what is being now mixed as an album that'll come out later this year you know mm -hmm. and so that's just a creative project that I can do that playing the music that I love, which is jazz and jazz fusion. My bread and butter is normally pop and rock going on tour or being in the studio for those artists. But um, so that's what I've been busy doing you know, on my quote unquote downtime whenever I don't have any obligations, even during the pandemic. Um, so that's basically what I've been busy doing <laughs> on my end. Julia? Um. For me, I think, you know, as I was saying earlier, the YouTube videos and all of those content stuff, content stuff I think it was very important to, to catch on to that as Corona hit. And because um, that's honestly the only way that we could communicate with our fans, especially at the beginning stages. And, you know, Instagram Live, there's so many 
apps these days that you can connect with. And of course, Terry has our song. And this is actually something that I was introduced to because I signed to a technology company, basically. I didn't sign with a record label. So these past few years of moving to Taiwan, um, I'm surrounded by people with laptops, engineers doing like data and statistics and all the things that sometimes you probably wouldn't imagine doing if you're going into a career like this. And, um, and with our song, we were able to make a lot of just making content, you know, making like very special ones for our core fans. And that's like, as we were talking about before, building that core fan base is so important. So more and more people start coming in and then they're willing to spend money on these special videos or special cards that we're putting out just for them to see. And so when it comes time for like, for example, when I put on a two day concert last year, so many people were able to buy tickets first. They were kind of like a VIP kind of thing. If you were on our song, you could get the tickets for my show first. And, um, and we just had a great turnout. And so I think technology is just, is just so important these days. You know, we, we should utilize as much as we can uh, with these new apps, new ideas that are coming out. Yeah. I think that's a, a great segue into um, our next questions about, you know, what, what tools or specific technologies have you been using to collaborate? Uh, you know, creatively, professionally. I know we've mentioned, you know, Clubhouse, but, you know, Taku, I know you were saying that you were, you were recording at home, right? Um, so what platforms are you using? Are, are, is there like, you know, for the music production recording process? Like, are, are, is there like, a, you know, a live sort of interactive, you know, jamming platform? Is, you know, are you sharing stems? Basically, I'm sharing stems. I haven't done any live, interactive playing uh most i mean it's you know apart from like mixing you know we'll, i have a producer on the east coast so we're 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 live mixing just via um zoom oftentimes you know and just been going over mixes and, and able to talk and i'm able to he has a camera set up at various points in the studio so i'm actually seeing and he's screen sharing uh what he's mixing on so that's pretty much that and so um and as far as recording at home, so yes, I have a setup, at, a studio setup at home. I record, even if it's for my own music or if it's for, let's say, Leanne Rhymes. I worked on her album all last fall and 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 a bit in this spring. And so, like her producer would just send me even raw tracks. Some of the stuff he would send me is just real basic uh, sketches that she would just do on her phone, and then you know. Uh, we would just lock into a tempo and then I would just lay down a bunch of stuff, send him back a bunch of stems. He would play around with stuff and figure out what he liked and then send it back to me once we had more of a, a skeleton of a song. And so it was kind of a collaborative effort, um, you know, um, and I, I think that that allowed me to be more in the creative process of, of the synthesis of a song rather than just being a studio musician getting hired and they know that everything's usually completely almost done by the time they call a percussionist in to, to do any overdubs if I'm physically going into the studio. So in this instance, um, working on our, on our two albums, actually, um, we were able to just like shoot stuff back and forth, back and forth, you know, over the course of a couple of weeks just to work on one or two songs. And um, so it was cool. It was really, I think that's the way it's going to be in a lot of ways. It, it depends obviously on the artist and in, in how, um, in tune they are like jay was saying like with, with their own uh, artistic destiny um but uh with leanne she's so tight with her producer and they're constantly collaborating coming up with even nuggets of ideas that they'll they'll shoot over to me or other musicians and then that that may you know get the process rolling of creativity on their end so there is a lot more back and forth and collaboration that way so and that's literally just Dropbox or we transferring stems, you know, and then I get something, I put it back on into my grid and I, I start recording over it. I start layering all my stuff and then I send them all separate stems, boom, there you go. And then we just keep going back and forth. So that's that's been the way over the last two years for sure. 
Um, just for our participants who don't who don't know what a STEM is, it, it's just a, a, an individual track uh, in a recording. So it could be an individual recording of you know one particular instrument or a component of an instrument. Yeah. Yeah. So in my case, like I may for a song, I may get um, I might end up getting uh, a master track from them, the BPM, then I throw it into my DAW, and then I just start going to town on it. And each stem, each track I do, it'll be you know a shaker track, a tambourine track, a, a cajon track, a, a conga track, and so then I do, you know, anywhere from four to ten different instruments, all the way through, and then I send them all separately, and they all, and I make sure they're all, you know, mixed, pan, whatever, how I like, I like to hear it, and then um, send it out over usually like we transfer or something in a folder and then it just, it should line up with their session completely. So that's the way we've been doing it. <laughs> and and maybe we can pass the ball to Jay. I don't know if you had a similar experience for producing artists. I, I mean, I, uh, Taco pretty much nailed it. Uh, I mean, that's pretty much how we do it. Uh, I mean, there's things like audio movers and things like that when you could actually direct vocals live. But for me, uh, yeah, it's been kind of weird for me. I, it, it didn't really work out too well. So, uh, you know, I, I usually have either a vocal producer uh, in respective countries that could track the vocals and send it back to me. So I, I recently did a project in Japan where, you know, uh, I met the art, I met the artist on Zoom and <laughs> basically, you know, did the whole production over Zoom. And then uh, I sent over the tracks, they tracked the vocals, sent it back to me to mix. But, uh, you know, uh, and there's there's some artists in Taiwan right now that uh, are trying to use audio movers and try to do a live session. So uh, I actually handed that over to my friend because <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't want to deal, deal with the headache. But, uh, you know, Terry, I'm probably going to hit you up for some vocal, uh, vocal directing later on for some artists that I'm working with. Yeah. Well, you, you know, I, I, I've never tried that, Jay. Like, um, like, like whether it's like what was that audio audio movers yeah is that like session wire it's, it's just basically recording yeah, you hear, yeah pretty much in real time but you know how it is i mean like if you're not physically yeah. in the room you it's know different. it's it's different because you gotta you guys still gotta tell the, the engineer like hey excuse me and they, they won't hear you <laughs> they just keep playing you know and then you're like hey stop stop and then you go oh and can you go back to uh that one word you know yeah it's just I yeah, so too. yeah, I I just rather have somebody I trust do the vocal, you know, do the vocal tracking and just send me the stems right. and then uh, we do, we finish it up here. But uh, you know, like finding uh, trustworthy vocal producers is not an easy thing either, you know. So yeah, uh, there's, there, there, yeah, there's only a few producers I trust. Uh, Terry's one of them, so probably send them. <laughs> I've been in sessions where we've used, utilized audio movers just simply for like kind of mixing. So I'm seeing stuff in real time, like seeing, you know, so I can uh, even with mixing my my album that I was able to kind of go in and I could watch and, say, you know, turn that up a bit, turn that down. OK, when we get to there, just, you know, do that, nudge it here and stuff like that. So for that, that's been good. But I have never done any live sessions with audio movers at all. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't, you know, with all the people I've, I've seen or talked to, I've never heard anybody successfully pull that off. <laughs> you know, there's, I mean, you can't really replicate somebody physically being there. I mean, especially with vocal, because uh, it's such a sensitive thing, right? Uh, you, know, you know, somebody has to physically be there to kind of even comfort them when they're stressed out, whatever, you know, to bring out the best performance. And it's, it's hard to do that on a video call. That's true. Um, so, so that was the, the, the creative side. Um, now let's talk maybe more the business side. And, and, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about our songs from Terrence, if possible. Oh, okay. So without getting too pitchy and with this. Um, Please, um, I love, you um, know, self-promotion. <laughs> four years ago, like, so um, just a little background. Like I, I work at the KK Box Group where we have an... Um, Taiwan's leading music streaming app, KKBox. Um, so that was actually the first music, legal music streaming platform in the world that began in 04. And um, so about four years ago, we were having this conversation and, and you know, like our CEO was like, he's like, you know what, like, 
there there's a part of me where I don't know if if I contributed to taking the unit price of music down to like almost zero because like a stream is like point something right and well point something of a cent or a dollar like it depends on which platform it is and um but then but then he you know he was jokingly saying he's like well it isn't entirely my fault because Steve Jobs already declared it 99 cents a single as compared to say three you know to five bucks like 20 years ago so so we were like oh okay well let let's figure out you know what are these emerging technologies that 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 we can explore to help musicians find a new format of music so like what comes after streaming and and for someone like me like and like growing up in the 90s like like a trip to tower records was like the happiest day ever so every tuesday or monday night at midnight lighting up at the record store to get that new release that was that was the best thing in the world and 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 i missed that right so so around that time you know like you know the whole blockchain movement around like 2016 and 17 uh it, we started really exploring it so we explored a couple of things the first thing we we were looking at was like oh okay with like with like blockchain um you can now actually create a digital asset so for example if an artist was to and and let's take someone like say taylor swift um she has a million fans right so she could literally sell a million shares of her song and and would that mean like her fans are now kind of like her investors so they because they own a part in the song you know they they help promote it or or you know or they sharing the songs with their friends it's kind of like yo use this product that i have a share in right or, or or like i have a share in apple so please buy more iphones um but but that was very far out because i remember our our lawyers in the us just yelling at us going like i don't care what you say that's a security and, then, and and I was like, okay, maybe we're too ahead. And so what we actually started looking at was like, all right, well, let's create digital um, digital vinyl. Like, what would that look like on your phone? And and so um, while when we first started, we weren't entirely what you call NFTs today. Um, we we're more like FT. So we were using like Ethereum ERC twenty tokens, and we. And we visualized it as these these cards um, that are like digital music trading cards, I guess you know. And um, so here, I'll, I'll just let me let me just pull something. So the collectibles market. Yes. Yeah, well, so it kind of began as so. Like here, I got one, Julius. You see, oh wait, the blur. <laughs> so you can actually flip these cards over. And then behind these cards, there's, you know, you can pack like content. <clears throat> so it was purely like a music collectibles kind of thing. Like, so I was like, oh, well, you can compare this to like a digital download, right? So this is, this is like the new iTunes store. The only difference is, <clears throat> is you can't copy it, right? Like there's there's only a limited amount of unique additions, right? <clears throat> and um and, and as we got into it a little bit more, uh, you know, one day we were like, well, there's not too many people on our app. Our DAU is pretty low, and and, and you know it's funny because like I thought about it again like last week. I was like, for a limited edition collectibles app, why were we looking at for like you know like one million people on the app every day? That that didn't make any sense, but at that time, we were like, all right, we should do something to encourage more people to come on the platform. So we we're like, well, what if when you bought this digital collectible, assuming it's an artist's new single, right? So you would actually have access to exclusive content. But what if we created a private community where the artist could, you know, an artist hosted private community? 
where it's like a fan club, right? So, so essentially anyone that buys your album gets to join a private chat group. And, um, and, and Julia was, was very willing to experiment this with us. And so, so we were like, okay, well, assuming like your core fan base is somewhere from like three to 5% of your Instagram followers. Let's see if that mathematically works out. So, so what's surprising is like Julia put a lot of like her new singles. So on top of like streaming uh, or even like, you know, like vinyl and, and, and all these traditional music formats for every new song she put out, she put it out on our song as a digital card and she would pack some extra content, sometimes even like the demo version of it. And different fans would buy different things. And yeah. eventually she formed this, she had this community, uh, which she calls the chill zone. And it's like a discord kind of server. And in there, fans engage with each other. And what was really interesting was, was on the morning of her concert, which was actually at like 7 p.m., at 6 a.m., my phone started buzzing and it was just getting nonstop notifications. And, and I opened it and in her community, fans were already lining up down and out the street and telling each other like, oh, it's getting cold, bring a sweater. Like we're, we're already down around the block. So, you know, like, you know, there's like 300 people in line in front of me. So make sure you get some food, get some coffee. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and some fans were coming up from like the South in Taiwan on the train. And they were like, oh, I won't be there till noon. And, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, wow, these are all people that probably don't know each other, but are here because of a common interest, right? Mm -hmm. So that that's really interesting. I, I mean, yeah. I think we all know that music transcends language. Music's like the language of love and, and it's able to bring like-minded people together mm -hmm. and watching that, that kind of, that community build. And, and so like, I, I remember Julia, right? Like right before you went mm -hmm. on stage, like, like I was telling her, I was like, wow, did you see all this engagement going on all day? And, and so, so and she so was like, Terrence, wow, if, I, if I may, Terrence, if I may just interject, because I, I love I love it that Julia is involved in this. And I, I sort of, I'm curious what Julia, what, what your experience, yeah. if we can hear from you directly, what your experience with this has been. Yeah, yeah. So I think it was a great way to um, connect even deeper with the fans, with the core fans, because, um, and I really was surprised when they would all message each other. They're all strangers to each other, but because of me and my music and their love and support for me, they all just start talking to each other and they'll like notice little details about something that I did that day of the show or what I wore or like they captured a funny photo of me and they would start making memes themselves. And it was just a really cool way to see more people connect with each other. And um, yeah, it was uh, bringing people together. And I thought, well, this is, this is how it, it should be, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. we're, we're moving into the future. And it's all mm -hmm. about technology, connecting mm -hmm. with people through apps and, and mm -hmm. all of that. So it was really cool. Yeah. Um, you know, this, uh, this, this conversation around the NFT, it's something that I keep um, coming across and I, it's, it's a, it's a real time conversation that's going on and I think people are, are curious about it. So um, I, I think there's really an interesting, uh, there's interesting potential there. Um, and, you know, it, actually the, the question of the NFT came up in the Africa panel too. Uh, of yesterday so people are kind of some people know about it some people don't know about it and you know like what are what are the you know what, what what's the law around it you know so this, this is kind of, kind of developing in real time but in the interest of time I want to kind of pivot on this word community that both Terence and Julia uh, you mentioned and I wonder um, you know over the year of the pandemic um, what have you done to because uh, community is so important, and um, it's you know your your mental well being, your your emotional well being, your self care. Um, and I want to ask all four of you, you panelists, what have you been doing to to take care of yourself or or to deal with um, 
you know, as you say, Jay, you were, you're in, you're in the dungeons, you know, and, you know, we're, we're all isolated. Uh, I know I've been isolated all year. Um, and so what have you been doing to kind of combat that or to, to kind of um, deal with that? I think, uh, I mean, even before the pandemic, I always created to relieve stress. Uh, I think for me, the biggest stress is not being able to create. Uh, and, um, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're too busy or whatever, you know, it, it kind of limits your time to be creative. Uh, this During the pandemic, it's sort of, it's like being on a plane for 15 hours. Like there's nothing to do, right? So you read a book and you could actually sleep because you know nobody's going to wake you up, right? So very similar. Uh, when the pandemic started, like I knew I would be stuck here. Uh, so I just had to be creative, you know, and it, it, it get, I had all the time in the world to be creative. And um, the funny thing is, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I've been in, like I said, I was in a band in the early 90s. I haven't sang a lick in a song since. And uh, for some reason, during the pandemic, I, I developed the guts to do my solo project, which is like completely like, uh, I mean, something that I would never have done uh, if, if it wasn't for the pandemic, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I released this project called Savian. Uh, and, you know, I released five songs that I've actually, I actually originally wrote it for other artists. And um, right when the pandemic hit, uh, I couldn't have any artists come over. So like, I ended up like, you know, I, you know, because I, I would sing the demos for them anyways. Then I thought, ah, let me just try to sing some of these myself, you know, and that's how the project started. So, uh, you know, it, it like like everybody was saying, uh, you know, makes you think outside the box and really like, I mean, you see the survivors from the people who fold, like like during the pandemic. Like you, I mean, even uh, even at the highest level, like like record execs that were thriving, you know, pre-pandemic during the pandemic, you see them like, like just buckle to their knees. And to some degree, uh, it sort of leveled the playing field. So like a lot of people were like now interested in your ideas. Like, they're like, like I want to hear something, you know, new and let's try, try to get on something new. So like, you know, even this NFT thing, like, you know, I, like I started hearing about it like a couple of weeks ago and already people are, you know, cause everybody's looking for a new idea, like to monetize or do something. Right. Cause it's, 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 uh, I mean, otherwise, like, there's nothing out there for uh, musicians at this time, you know, uh, for the most part, uh, as long as there's no live performances, you know, a lot of artists aren't going to put out albums. So that's all going to trickle down to musicians, producers, writers, and so forth. So like, you know, uh, and, and you ask how we monetize, uh, like, for me, a lot of the monetization happened from my prior songs, you know, in my, in my life, like my catalog, you know, like I make my usual royalty checks. And that sort of kind of put me through these hard times, uh, if, if anything. And, and, and like I said, I've been fortunate enough to work on uh, several projects while uh, you know, we were in pandemic. So, uh, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to keep busy, but you know, I, I don't represent the entire community for sure. Because even, even in my circle of friends, uh, you know, like I said, people haven't worked for like almost two years, you know. Uh, so it's, it's, been, it's been a tough dry period for everybody. Yeah. So Jay, you're saying. So the question is, you know, what, how have you, you know, comforted yourself through a music uh, through a period where the music landscape was devastated? And your answer is, uh, I did more music. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, that, I mean, <laughs> for musicians, I think. Yeah. yeah right. for, for musicians, this, this is our this is our thing. You know, like right. it's our way of. We live and breathe music, and that is how. We yeah, we have to ourselves. release the creativity. Otherwise, you know, and I go. I I picked up cycling too, so I go cycling exercise. <laughs> Which I which I yeah. never used to do. I used to never exercise. I used to sit in this chair all year long, and then I, I started exercising. So it's a good thing. Yeah. But uh, that that's great, Jay. Um, that's it was wonderful to hear about that. And now, Taku, Terence, and Julia, how have you? Uh, what steps have you taken to take care of yourself? Uh, on our end, well, first of all, we got out of New York and we moved to Los Angeles, and that would not have happened had not been for the pandemic. We would have stayed there. So uh, with my wife's job, she had to go remote anyway, so it didn't really matter. And so it was okay for her to move to Los Angeles. It's actually better for me. And um, I, I, we've been living in New York for the past 10 years, but primarily my whole career has been based out of LA even all of my touring equipment has stayed in LA this entire time. So, so being back in LA was the first kind of self care, you know, um, mental health check, uh, thing that we did. And it, it's, it's been so great to be out here and have a little more space, a lot nicer weather, mm. you know, um, 
be able to see the mountains and just and uh, you know just be in, in better weather. Um, same with Jay. I actually uh, am exercising a whole lot more. So <laughs> the, the the Peloton treadmill is, is has definitely been a godsend. So I've actually. Uh, after the initial pandemic of getting way out of shape just because you end up <laughs> self-medicating by eating and drinking whatever, I actually started getting way into getting in shape. And then uh, separately from that, as far as music and creating, like I said, I'm working on my own project. So uh, that has kept me busy in addition to what projects that have, you know, I've gotten calls for here and there. Uh, and like I said, Tours and live music has kind of gone by the wayside over the last year. So um, most of it is is just in the studio as far as being creative, whether it's for myself or for other people. Um, and, I, you know, I relish those projects because a lot of, I think, almost all the projects I've done for other artists that have come in during the pandemic have been really creative. And, and I've been really kind of uh, been able to flex my creativity, you know, so so that's been therapeutic as well. It's been fun. Mm, yeah, I love that flex your creativity. That's that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, Terrence, Julia, <laughs> Julia, you want to go? Okay, sure. So, yeah, I got into sports too. I got into wow. tennis and badminton. Never done that my entire life. But um, I think everything started to slow down for me because for the first two and a half to three years of my career, we were. We were building it so we were taking every opportunity that came to us everything that came out was like yes let's do it yes let's do it so we I felt like there was a big acceleration for the first uh first part of my career and as soon as the pandemic hit everything slowed down and I felt like I I hit a pause because you know at, at one point we weren't allowed to you know go out or, or we just didn't want to go out because that's really scary. Mm -hmm. And um, and I felt like I actually had time and space to reflect on what mm -hmm. these past few years were all about and how I got to this point and how I can do better. So as an artist, when you're busy working and performing every day for like three years, sometimes you forget uh why you're doing this sometimes there's going to be moments you're like what am i doing why did i start this so it was good to to have that time to think back on um you know my passion for music is what brought me here to this moment and mm -hmm. it was a it was good for my mental health as well because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm usually a very positive person but look there's definitely going to be moments where you're just like what is going on why am i here because when you sing songs so many times hundreds of times and you do it three times a day you're going to feel a little numb at some point and um and uh i felt like i, I had to take this time to uh to kind of work on my mental health as well and just mm -hmm. and think about what i want to do now why mm -hmm. why do i still want to keep going and am I here for the right reasons? All, all, all these questions. Self, yeah. self reflection. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. So we have, uh, we have make more music. We have flex your, uh, your creativity. We have reflect and Terrence. What, what have you been? First of all, I, I, you know, Jay mentioned earlier. Like, I, I actually think, like, I've, I, I, for me personally, I've, I've met way more people in the last year. <laughs> than, than I usually ha would have. I've been able to have access mm. and conversations with people mm. that I normally wouldn't, mm. right? So I, I think I think that's the, the upside of the last year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us in like in Taiwan, like we've never really had a lockdown. I think last March, was it mm -hmm. March, April? I, I think la last March and April, were the scary was, was the scary period yeah. but then mm -hmm. after that um you know like life kind of goes on just everybody's also just a bit more conscious so i mm -hmm. i i I've, I've learned a lot about zoom fatigue from like people that i talk to so i i i've 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 learned to be more empathetic about like mm -hmm. you know this this situation and um but 
but but you know in, in general i think if i had to put the the last 12 months into one word i would say that word's inspired like, mm. like I, i've been extremely inspired um by by all the opportunities that i'm starting to see in this post covid world i think we all see it you know like um <clears throat> We've already been doing a lot of things um, through the internet on cloud for you know for the last decade and or even the decade and a half already, but but this pandemic and this way of life in the last twelve years has reaffirmed to us that it's okay and we should further explore that. Like it, you know, like I met Julia when she sent me an email like it was like eight nine years ago right so so and maybe 10 years ago or nine years ago that would be like a, a rarity but then the idea of like hitting someone up in a dm and getting to know someone you, you never know when someone's going to respond like i said i've been having co way more conversations with people that I, I i normally wouldn't be able to have access to and so that opportunity has been huge so I, I think moving forward, when this pandemic uh, is over, I think these are the ways of life that we've already become so used to. So that's going to mm -hmm. stay, you know, these op like opportunities have now grown 10x if you embrace the cloud, right? And, and the promise of the cloud. Mm -hmm. But it, it's up to you to decide like how, how you, what, what, what you want to make the most out of it, right? So whether or not you're established or if you're even a new artist, like it could be that 10 fans, right? You might just be like starting out, you might just have those 10 fans. And, and maybe when you have 10 fans, you can still reply them in the DMs and stuff like that. But take care of those 10 fans because those 10 fans are going to be your advocates, right? They're going to go grab five and now you got 50, right? And then when you got 50 fans, they're gonna grab 250 and maybe after 250, the Instagram algorithm starts working in your favor. I don't know, right? So so like yeah, it's it, right. it, everybody starts from zero, but mm -hmm. but there's just so much more opportunity to do that now because yeah. we're all connected by these data points. So, on the so that's such a provocative idea, the promise of the cloud. Uh, that's yeah, yeah. that's very <laughs> That's uh, it's something to to think about, really. Um, yeah, that's great. Uh, it's great to hear how um, you all have been sort of processing and kind of um, you know the things that you've you've taken from, from the year. Um, we we have just about uh, like fifteen minutes left, and I think um, Chris uh, is going to start off with some audience Q and A. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I noticed a question from. Gary Musinski, I I'm, I'm apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name right. Andrew, um, Gary's there. Could you spotlight him and give him the chance to, to ask his question? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for a great session. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Yeah. Hi, Taku. Good to see you, man. Um, I, I put in some questions in the chat, but there were several. Was there a particular one you wanted me to ask? Just pick your top one. <laughs> Gosh. Um, okay, well. If I, if I may, if, if I may, I, I, I love the one about um, the independent artists. I think that would be very helpful for the Yeah, the yeah. so I'm an independent yeah. artist. I'm doing my own music mix, which... <laughs> I'm calling uh, acoustic world jazz, at least that's what it is today. Um, and I'm just curious about, you know, it's a very high end product. It's taken me eight years to do and a budget of 23,000 and it's almost done. I'm doing a CD. I'm gonna, I'm not planning on doing a lot of streaming. I'm gonna try and monetize doing down high res downloads. Um, you know, not just 9624, but up to DSD 256. So it's somewhat specialized. And I guess I'm just not sure about how important is it what I call my music. Like, I don't want it necessarily 
to be considered new age, but it's also calming and relaxing. I just read that uh, Esperanza Spalding is doing more music that combines jazz with kind of a healing intent. So I guess my question is, how should I think about my niche categorization, categorizing my music? Is that so important anymore? Um, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, well, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about it. Uh, I mean, from my experience, I mean, obviously I'm not doing, uh, uh, you know, I'm working more in the, I guess, pop genres, but, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, questions where, um, you know, there's a mixture of genres. You know, if it's like, oh, if it's jazz and, I don't know, like, or hip hop and country, which one do I put it in? Do I put it in hip hop or do I put it in country, right? So, uh, I mean, from my experience, uh, I mean, you know, and when I say my experience, it's based on, like, we're trying to, like, get as much promotion and, I guess, uh, kind of, like, commercial exposure as possible, right? So, for us, we usually went with the smaller genre. So, like, I had a, I had a, a band that was R&B and pop. So, if we went on the pop chart, we'd be competing with, like, you know, people with like hundred million dollar budgets, right? So, right. yeah. So we went on the R and B chart, and we actually hit number one because uh, you know it, it, it's it, there's far less people. You, you don't need to sell a million records to be in the top forty, right? So, uh, and that's usually how we decide the chart charting. So, like you know, it's kind of like I guess you know when you try to apply for a college and you know you pick the easiest major to get in, like. <laughs> Or like, or something that's completely like, uh, you know, off off the map. Where like, you know, or like you're trying to uh, be a harp major or something, and you have to have a harp. There's only like two people in your school, right? So you get, you know, it's that same concept, sort of, right? So we usually go with the smaller genre, so we could like actually have a. First, so if you do chart on one of those charts, you could screen cap that, and you could use that as promotion for your write ups, and you know, you could. It's something to light up something, you know, like. Uh, the future moves like that you do like whether it's write-ups or you know blogs or even Instagram posts you know like hey you know guess what I'm you know uh, uh, you know in the top 20 on this chart and it's you know it's actually on there right so uh, you know and you could use that to utilize to promote your albums even further Jay I love your comments and unless I get my music into films even with all that work chances are I'm not really going to be able to monetize my creative output so would you agree i mean yeah again it's, it depends you know if, if you do get it into films uh you know i'm sure you can monetize that way uh you know like syncing is a huge business uh whether it's tv shows movies t you know right. commercials whatnot uh and that's that's a whole another niche that you could uh, approach with uh, and the crazy thing is, you know, uh, lately I, I listen to a lot of new age music on spotify uh and a lot of times, you know, I, I, I like to play that to kind of relax myself. And I look at each one of those songs that they got like 30 million streams, okay. you know. And I'm like, wow, there's a huge market for this stuff. Okay. Uh, you know, so, you know, actually, you know, it, sometimes some of those songs get more airplay than uh, or more, more uh, you know, streams than pop music. Interesting. In many cases. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll <laughs> take that going to be. The future is going to be very friendly for niche vertical. Yeah. And I think right now, especially with people stressing out during the pandemic, I mean, uh, chill out music is like, I think the number one genre, like everybody has it on playlists, right? Okay. I mean, for me, I think my entire playlist is all chill out, like just new age piano and just something to relax me. Like, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I got I to send you my music then. Yeah. I would love to hear it. Okay. Cool. Thank you for your question, Gary. Thank you, everybody. Um, let's see, uh, we we do have one sort of final uh, panel question, but Chris, did you want to um, uh, ask any others from the, the chat box or else I can uh, toss one? Sure, um, I, I noticed earlier, um, well, actually there's one that just popped up um, mm -hmm. from Grant. Yes, um, I was looking at that one too. Do you, is... So Grant and, Zeng, and, if you are in the room and uh, you would like to, unmute yourself and ask the question. We'd love for you to do that. Let me just add you to the spotlight. Yeah. So, yeah, I think Grant oh, is Hello. Here. Yeah, oh. hi, Grant. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask Terry about uh, 
our beat because I know that was a kind of an offshoot of our song. I never got the app to actually work myself, but oh. I did want to know how that compared into building community and exclusivity and the whole digital vinyl thing and compared to our song. Yeah, so our beat's like an experiment. Like it was just me and, and, and a couple of guys and, and the apps online too. It's it, it's the way the what it is it's 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 literally an instagram for for beat makers because i i love beats i think all of us here we we love rhythm so um and but initially it was it was finding a way because you know a, a lot of people buy beats online these days and, and sometimes you know people buy like 19 dollars beats off beat stars but then on the other side of the world, someone has a number one song and, and the original beat maker can't track it or doesn't know, of, you know, where that beat went. And so that was what our beat was like. Um, we just wanted to, to, to ex- start this adventure to figure out how beat makers could actually monetize from collaboration um, instead of just selling beats one off. Right. So how you can make that residual income? Um, so that it's it's a it's a completely different thing, but still a work in progress. Its ultimate goal is to create a very uh, low cost copyright regime for beat makers. But now it's it's kind of presented more in like a way where beat makers can can create their own uh, beat radio, which is like an Instagram profile for beats, and then um, people can collaborate with each other. Yeah, and I think that um, for our panelists here, if you have a, a, a website that you'd like to share with, with the room, uh, please drop it oh. in the chat so people can look you up or find you on LinkedIn yeah. or um, become your fan maybe. Um, and with that, I think uh, Chris has one final question um, before we start to think uh, about wrapping it up. So yeah. please share your link, yes. Yeah, and I was just gonna ask Gary to share his his link, but I just noticed that he did so, so that's great. Um, so yeah, so I mean, we're nearing the end of the, the session and um, oh man, so many of these topics, I, I would have loved to, to spend another hour and, and talked about these things. And, you know, I'm hoping that we, we can connect offline and, you know, if the participants are watching, uh, they can go and, 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 you know, follow you on socials. Um, so just as one final wrap up question, in, in one or two sentences, what advice would you have for our students moving forward? You know, like what is what is the skill they should develop? What, what do they need to think about? Like, what is that one, you know, piece of advice that you would tell them to say, okay, this is the most important lesson in my opinion for pandemic and moving forward? I know that's a big question, but. Wow, that's, yeah, that is, that's a, it's such a broad, uh question but uh you know uh like th- this sound this may sound kind of weird or harsh to some people but you know for me it's it's like you, you know the whole thing of knowing your worth right uh you have to so once you graduate school and you're out in the professional field you have to know your worth uh but uh, the problem is a lot of people like overvalue themselves right from the get-go right so you have to know exactly what you're worth going in and uh, you know and, and you know just having an overall respect for the industry and you know and and like everybody was saying before uh, nothing comes for free right so you know it, it's uh you have to love music so much so that you would be willing to do it for free because right now you practically are <laughs> right but uh you really have to love it and eventually the payoff will come advice thank you Anybody else? Uh, I think, especially I'm kind of speaking for any of the aspiring uh, students who are instrumentalists or, or may not be, uh, you know, looking to be an artist up front, possibly, but they wanted to have a career in either performance or recording or even composition. And I think um, one, it's just, especially the one thing I learned during this pandemic is just like, just learn as much as you can take advantage of whatever time you have to do whatever research learn 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 do research try to figure stuff out it's uh, there's so many as you can hear just from this panel discussion that there's so many different burgeoning fields that are just coming about whether it's nfts or 
or whatnot, even um, just learning new platforms. Do the research, see, see what's best for you. And, um, you know, because the learning never stops. You can't rest on your laurels. You just have to keep moving forward, forward, forward. And, and um, if the, the, the person who is always kind of on in the know and on the cutting edge is the one who's usually gonna be the one that's gonna uh, be the front runner. So that's what I would say. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, Tafu. Terrence, Julia? Um, Terry, you want to go or? Julia. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> I think is to uh, just do it and don't think too much about it. I think you got to keep going, and especially if you have the passion for it. Um, work on your craft every single day and not stop. And, um, and, you know, we're living in the technology age. Put your stuff out there. You're going to get heard and you're going to get seen. Um, you know, that's something that I, I'm still trying to practice as well as to not overthink because, you know, if you're being too calculative about when your next drop is or like what it should be, sometimes it, it gets with your head and, it, and oftentimes it doesn't perform as well as <laughs> Um, when you initially wanted to just drop something because you just have to drive for it, you know, so yeah. just do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. That's great advice. Yeah. I think for me, it, it kind of sums up uh, what everyone was saying is, is, you know, <laughs> the pandemic has been like this worst case scenario, right? So, so this preconceived notion of failure or at worst, this is what your situation is. I, I think we we need to not be afraid, like to embrace failure or embrace mm. the, the embrace the beautiful the beauty of zero ness, right? Because um, we've already kind of seen this worst case scenario happen out pan out over the last year, and 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 we're still here. We're we're facing it, so. So whether or not you're starting out a career, you know, this this beauty of of being at zero is a wonderful thing. It's actually like like I miss it, right? So I like to go back to it all the time. Every time I get to a certain point, I go back to that to the beginning and I and I deliberately take myself back to zero. So embracing failure and, and loving the start is a very important thing. Wow, that's um, that's great. I, I love that. That's so philosophical. Um, I, I, I find that inspiring. Um, all four of your comments. Uh, so, so thank you so much. We are just a couple of minutes over. So um, I think we're, we're going to have, have to leave it there. But um, we are just so grateful to our panelists for an engaging conversation this evening. Uh, thank you, Jay, Jay Chang, Taku Hirano, Terrence Lung, Julia Wu. Uh, thank you again to the Antonia and Vladimir Kuleyev Cultural Heritage Fund for their support in making this event possible. Please tune in again tomorrow for the final panel of this series. It's gonna be in less than 24 hours, y'all. Focusing on music in the age of COVID in Europe and the Americas this time. That panel will be moderated by Toki Wright, Chair of Professional Music, and Ralph Jackady, Professor of Music Business and Management right here at Berkeley. We look forward to another interesting and informative session and another roster of esteemed artists and educators and of course, thank you all for joining us uh, this evening for this remote panel. It's great to see everyone um, and we hope that you enjoyed the session. Be well, everyone. Uh, you can drop your, your uh, greetings in the chat and um, you know you, you have everyone's social handles. So, so follow all these four uh, amazing panelists. Thank you everyone for coming, everyone be healthy and have a good night. Right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you guys. Good night. Okay.